We had fun with Steve all week long. This was Steve's first time here at our, our place, but uh, by no means is Steve a first timer. Now, you've been doing comedy for how long now? Uh, about 14 years now. 14 years. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you grew up uh, in uh, Kansas City, which you talked about earlier. Yep. Is it true that uh, six brothers, one sister? That is very true, yes. And you, where do you fall in that? I was number two, actually. Number two? Yeah. So you, you were kind of the one instigating the teasing and the harassing. Yes, it probably was me. Uh, uh, not so much the one getting it. Uh, uh, is the oldest a brother or a sister? It's a brother. Oh, okay. They, well, we were all boys until the final. If my older brother would have been a girl, I never would have been born because that's all my mom ever wanted was a girl. Oh, it was one of those deals. Yeah, she finally had a girl with number seven. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and I'm sure that made your dad happy. Uh, <laughs> my, I have a cousin that did exactly that same thing. They had a boy, and then they had another boy, and they wanted, let's try for one more girl, and then they had twin boys. And, and then they had another boy, and then they finally had the girl, and, uh, and, and, and he shot himself. <laughs> um... um <laughs> Now, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're, uh, anybody in your family, well, I'm curious, what, what, mom and dad, were the, what did they do for a living? Uh, my mom was just a stay-at-home mom, uh -huh. and then my dad, he just works at the, uh, at the railroad company. Oh, okay. And uh, did, did, Catholic? Um, I guess Baptist would be. You guess Baptist. Well, <laughs> Usually Baptist. Well, the only reason I ask is in my, fa in my neighborhood, I grew up in a neighborhood in Tennessee uh, where it was, uh, we literally had a Protestant school at one end of a block and a Catholic school at the other end of the block. And all the Protestant families had one, two, or three kids. And all the Catholic families started at five to some number you just didn't even, weren't even sure. I mean, so usually when you, for us at where I grew up, if it was a family that, Large, it was usually a Catholic family, but no, just Baptists who like to have sex. Whatever Charles Stanley is on TV, that's <laughs> what we were. Don't even know. <laughs> um, and and was, it, was there anybody in your family that was an influence on you to become an entertainer? You know what? It's, I, when I grew up, I really... I, I had kind of a strange childhood, so I really... I honestly thought that I was an idiot. And so I acted like an idiot when I got out of high school. I didn't take anything seriously. I didn't go to college. And, um, and so I, j I just sort of, you know, that's kind of my behavior. And then when I finally started getting into stand-up comedy, I felt like there, there was something that I was finally good at. There's a place for idiots, you found. Exactly. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. And, uh, and then after I, I got into it and I started a career and then I was on the television show, I then found out that my... Uh, my dad's uncles were actually the original uh, backup singers for Hank Williams Sr. Oh. And they had like their own, they were like called the Oklahoma Boys when they were the backup, and then they would turn into the Willis Brothers or something like that. But they're like, like old time country. Like. But that's famous country. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, that's I mean, pretty stellar. But I can't say that they like had an influence on me, but right. I mean, that's probably where I had the, always had that desire, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so you, uh, when you came out of high school, before you got into stand-up comedy, what, what were the jobs you, you had leading up? Um, like Burger King. <laughs> uh, it's funny because I, <laughs> I, I got into a situation where I had to move out. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't remember what, what happened, but I had to move out right away. I was standing with my brother and his wife was like, he has to go. And because um, I'd been there for like two months and I had to find something right away. And so I went to the uh, to the job place and I just found this uh, this job that said that you could actually stay at the house while you worked there. So I thought, well, I solved two problems here. And so I went to the job interview and I was like, I have to take it. And I went there and I didn't know it at the time, but it was actually helping handicapped kids. Oh. And um, which at the time I was like terrified of. I'm glad that I got the opportunity because it was one of the greatest experiences of my life and very rewarding and all that. Yeah, it was very awesome. <laughs> but before I got there, it was definitely not something I would have taken. And, uh, but I had to take whatever it was because I didn't have any place to sleep that night. Okay. And so I was actually literally doing the job interview and as they were interviewing me to kind of see how I was around the, you know, the handicapped guys, uh, one of the uh, kids was actually like sitting next to me and he was in a wheelchair and he had like this ball. And while I was doing my interview, he kept bouncing the ball off of my head. 
<laughs> he would just say ball, and then it bounced off my head, and I didn't flinch at all because I needed a place to stay. So I was like, oh yeah. It's like, do this thing all the time. It's not, it's not a big deal. Boom. It doesn't even phase me. Was that in Kansas City? Uh, that was in, well, Raytown, which is like a suburb of Kansas yeah, City. Close, close. And uh, so, so the, you had that job, you worked at Burger King, just other odd jobs. Uh, when did comedy come in? The jobs that I worked were so shitty and so bad that when I finally got a job at Citibank, um, my parents, everybody was so proud that I even had a job that had any kind of benefits uh, or that lasted longer than uh, three months. Uh, that I think everybody was terrified that I would do something stupid and screwed up. But I was working at Citibank. I was working in the, um, the deceased department, uh, or as I would, I called it the organically challenged. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I had a really cool job. I got, I actually would uh, call up the secondary uh, card uh, member, and uh, after their, uh, you know, their their spouse had passed away, and I got to tell them that they were no longer responsible for the card, which they were glad to hear that because they didn't have the debt after the bad news and everything. So it was actually a really nice job. But because I was the new person, they had this Halloween contest and um, somebody had to paint like this pumpkin. And I was the new guy, so I had to do it. And I like wrote down all these different impressions that I do because I was gonna record it into the tape recorder, drop it in the pumpkin right before they judged it. I thought that would be one way of winning. And when I wrote down all the people that I do impersonations of, I thought to myself, you know, I'm probably not gonna have a lot of years left where I can try to do something with this. So if I'm gonna do it, I better do it now. And everybody was just terrified when I quit my job that had benefits and retirement and all that uh, to pursue a career in uh, comedy. But uh, I think it was, uh, I think it worked out okay. All right, did you start at uh, uh, Stanford & Sons in, uh, in Kansas City? Yep, that was my very first club. Yes, which is a great club. And, uh, and then uh, from there, now, uh, you are living in Philadelphia, correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, how long have you been there? Uh, about two years. Two years. And uh, you, what, what at this point uh, has been the most exciting break for you that, you know, that really made you feel like, man, I'm doing the right thing? Um, well, when I first started out, they said, because uh, I, I was always able to do voice impersonations, so I would do voice impersonations. And so they said, well, he's just a, a, a voice comic. He just does imp impressions. And like, that was like, I guess to you know, put me down or say that I wasn't as good as or something, but I thought that that was something that made me stand out. <clears throat> so I thought, well, I'd have to try you know, do something else. And so I, I taught myself how to play the guitar. And I started uh, incorporating music into my shows. And then they said, well, he's just a, a voice guy that, that, that plays guitar, and that's it. And so then I got to the point where I said, OK, fine, I'll just teach myself how to animate. And then that's when I animated this cartoon. And um, I worked on it for about a year and a half. And I was like literally working like 80 hours a week, at least, because I did everything, all of the work, all by myself. And uh, when it just got accepted into the Montreal Just for Laughs Festival, that was like a very fine and, moment for me. And that's, that, is the, that is the most prestigious comedy festival in the world. And, uh, and your animation piece uh, got in, and it was one of the top ones there. It got the, a lot of chatter. It was the best one there. I mean, it was like, I was afraid that, I, that mine wouldn't be able to, wouldn't, you know, be as good as everyone else's. So I was like really nervous. And then the, mine was, and I'm not like saying this to be braggadocious, but like, Mine was like really good and it pissed the other guys off. One of the other guys stood up and like accused me of, of lying about it being my first time ever animating. He couldn't prove it though, could he? No, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, now tell, tell them a little bit uh, about, uh, because that's the next thing we're gonna talk about just a little bit, is that you're, and I thought it was interesting, the other comedian that was with us on the weekend uh, made the statement, he goes, he goes, uh, Steve's a production comic, and I've never heard that term before, but I, it suits you perfectly. Each piece of your show is, uh, for the most part, is a produced uh, little piece within itself, and then that's led you into the animation. Now, the, and they can see the animation on your website, which is called? Poopymullet.com. Poopymullet.com, for real. And, uh... And, and it is about... It came up with the name while I was in Arcadia, by the way. <clears throat> really? That's where it was? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever been at like a white trash barbecue and like had too many baked beans and then tried to play chicken in the kiddie pool, but that's where I came up with the name. Poopy mullet. 
<laughs> and so your uh, your animation is about uh, it's about it's actually a, it's a reality show. I filmed a reality show, and I wanted to put like a unique twist on it. So I thought if I teach myself how to animate, um, and then animate to the audio, then it will give it a. a a unique twist that, that people haven't seen. Plus, with it being animation, I can add certain elements to it that you couldn't do with regular show. Like, for instance, because um, these guys are nuts. Uh, they've like the three brothers that own the comedy club. They've served more than 50 years in prison between the three of them. And uh, a couple of them like were like they used to rob banks all the time. In fact, one time they got so high that they forgot to wear a disguise when they robbed the bank, and that's how they got busted. Um, but they used to do all this crazy shit. And um, the owner. He like always talks, he's always yapping, he's always like giving unsolicited advice to the comics about how they can make their careers better. And he was doing this with Gallag uh, Gallagher, and Gallagher punched him. And so I thought it would be cool to animate like what Gallagher's thoughts were before he punched him. And so that's one of the things that we added to it. But it did really good at the, um, at the comedy festival. Oh, cool. And uh, now, now you've, like I say, each thing is a production piece. You, mm -hmm. you, and you told me that you've got an idea, which I thought was so cool, uh, about an interactive piece uh, with animation that you can do uh, on stage in a club. And, and tell the audience a little bit about that, how that would work. Well, now that I, I picked up animation and started um, doing that, I thought to myself I should try to make this a part of my show because I've never seen anybody do anything like that. I kind of did something similar. I, I had uh, put together a program on my computer um, where I was doing like an interact, uh, interactive uh, thing with the audience. And so I'm working on, on a, a, a deal where I will actually, I'll take suggestions from the audience and I'll say, what kind of a movie do you want? Um, who do you want to star in it? And then the audience will literally pick out the movie and then I will have it already um, set in the, um, in the computer and it will play. And then I'll have other people that participate and it will it'll be like a live animation that takes place up on stage while I do the voices and everyone like take, play, uh, take part in it. So they create it within the audience. Yes. That's awesome. Yep. And uh, um, now, plans for the future. Uh, if every, in, the next, in the next five years or so, if everything goes the way you would like it, where would you like to be? Uh, retired in Hawaii. <laughs> Me too. Very good. How do you I don't, plan I don't on putting like, that money together? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even need a house. I just want like a boat, just a nice boat, and then I'll go out and I'll go fishing. I'll go deep sea fishing like all day long. I'll even work, I'll catch fish and then sell the fish, eat sushi all day long. That's like my dream. All right, so you're basically a small business. That's what we are, we're a small business. And so as a small business, you would have a business plan, you would have goals uh, uh, to reach, the, to get to that point. To, uh, what, what do you, how do you see that unfolding? Well, um, I mean, the animation that I just did, mm -hmm. as well as it's doing, I'm already like two or three animations ahead that I'm working on. I've got something really big that I'm working on now. Uh, I'm doing something to uh, like kind of poke fun at like um, uh, politics. Yep. And so I came up with this name for my cartoon called Washingtons, and uh, I'm putting it together and I'm kind of making fun of everybody in Washington. And uh, I think it's going to be like a real big hit. So your, your hope would be what we would see you is not becoming a so much a major celebrity as, uh, as a performance artist as much as being the creator of something like The Simpsons or Futurama or something along that line. Absolutely, because here's the thing. Um, I, I did a, uh, some research on Seth MacFarlane. And the very first pilot that he ever put together, he was given $50,000. And um, he spent like six months in his basement. It was his story was very similar to mine, but he had fifty thousand dollars and he had like uh, animation training. Um, he went to animation school and, and he had all of these things working in favor for him. I had none of those things and I only got paid five thousand dollars, which didn't even pay for the cost and didn't pay for all my food. I, my car was repossessed. I mean, I, it was like really, really tough to get through that time, but I knew I was doing something special. And so I could literally walk into a network like ABC or CBS and say, hey, this is what he put together on for his first pilot. Here's my first pilot. Now pay me some money, and I will go and I will create you a pilot because I can come up with characters and do voices and do shit like that like all day long. Like that's what I do. That's what I'm good at. And so, I'd be happy with like e even Seth MacFarlane was saying. You know, like nowadays, like like people would laugh at fifty thousand um, dollars, or was no was it, no five hundred thousand dollars was what he got paid. 
And he said, nowadays. That's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> that zero is big. Um, but he said, nowadays, like, uh, you literally, to, to do a 15 minute cartoon pilot, it costs, it, it would cost you a million dollars. That's the going rate. And I did mine for like $5,000. And I'll, here, I'll show you guys real quick. Hold on. It's crazy because I did mine for 50 bucks. <laughs> But it's stick, man. Let's see here. Uh, and right after this, before we get out of here, if you want to ask any questions, we'll let you guys ask any questions you'd like of Steve. Anything about what you saw tonight or what we've talked about or just curiosity about what we do. Like there's some of what, uh, I, don't know if you guys, oops, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but... It's like what my animation looks like. You have cartoon. to pass it around. Yeah. Well, I'll be showing it actually. Oh, afterwards. okay. Yeah, because you'll be you'll be right in the back I'll with be your DVDs. The DVDs yeah. Yeah. So you guys can see a little bit of it, but. Uh, Mr. McCarty, thank you for a wonderful show. Oh well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Always. That's right. Is that one of the escorts? <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks. Oh, they already left. Look. Yeah, they did. Wow. Well. I guess, I guess they were on a time, you know, constraint. Yeah, I guess he was running out of time. A any questions for Steve? Anything at all? Anything at all? Yes. Is this, oh, no. No, he's just drinking a beer. I thought he, <laughs> thought he was raising it. Is there any, anything at all? That, any curiosity? Okay. Uh, my last question always is, uh, is there a great bit in your head that you want to write that you haven't written yet? Um... I want to I want to write like a, a brilliant fart joke because I've always said that like the best joke you can write is a brilliant fart joke because like because the people that are not that smart laugh just because you said the word fart you know like and the brilliant people get the brilliant part but then they also love the fact that the dumb people are laughing just because I said the word fart you know it's like it works out for everybody. So in other words this would be the kind of fart joke that would be on uh, A&E PBS. A PBS fart joke, like um, the Lear Report fart joke. Yeah, Some, something sophisticated like that. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Kramer, let Thank him you. hear it. Steve will be right there, and you can head on down there if you like, so you'll be there when they finish up. Steve will be right there with his DVD and, and say hello. Um, we got some uh, great stuff coming up. Uh, next week, uh, Miss Caroline Ray will be here.